Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Nit Sweeney and I am an application engineer with CATI and my focus since the day I was brought on board has been a lot on DriveWorks. Now, I've actually worked on both sides of the DriveWorks implementation. So I've started off doing DriveWorks implementations uh, back when I first learned the tool. So I was working with customers on actually implementing the tool. So they would they'd get the tool and they'd say, this is the dream that we have. And I had to help them make it a reality. Recently, I've been more on the pre-sale side. So customers say, here's the problem that we have. Here is what we're running into. Here's what we would like to see in the future. What tool do you have that can help it? And it, it, my face lights up when I realize, hey, drivers can be a big help for these guys. So what I want to do today is kind of take away some of the mystery of DriveWorks. We talked about DriveWorks and it's this design automation tool. Um, and maybe you guys have said, you know what, I, I think that drivers could be the right tool, but I don't know what this looks like for an administrator. You know, how much effort is this? What does it look like if I want to make changes? That's what I want to do. I want to peel away the complexity. I want to take the mask off of driver solo and show you this is what that tool is. This is what it feels like to be inside of DriveWorks. So specifically, this is kind of our topics for the day. So first off, in case you're not terribly familiar with driver solo, I'm going to introduce, you know, what is it? What does the tool do from a high level? Then we're going to talk about how it controls specifically SolidWorks models. SolidWorks models are the bread and butter of driver solo. It's really what the focus is on. So we'll talk about how do you actually control that stuff? What does drivers need to understand? How do you make sure drivers does understand that? Then we're going to talk about the rules. Rules truly are what tells drivers how to do something. So first we tell drivers what we want to control with the SolidWorks models. Then we're going to, then we go into how to do that with the rules. How do, why do we do one thing instead of something else? Where do we find this information? That's kind of what rules are going to specify. Then we're going to talk about making changes. So what do you do when you want to change the user interface? When you want to change your SOLIDWORKS models, we're going to dive into that. Then testing it. How do you make sure that everything works? Because anybody can say, can make a change and say, this is going to do exactly what you want. But until you test it, you don't know for sure. So testing is a really important part. So then we're going to remove the mask. I'm going to go into my live environment. We'll take a look at that, the driver solo project, working on some SOLIDWORKS models. We'll make a change to the user interface. We'll create a table. And we're just going to go through and look at some model rules and how we can change them and manipulate them. So first, what is DriveWorks Solo? And DriveWorks as a tool is a design automation software. Now where DriveWorks Solo really excels is creating your SOLIDWORKS models. So if you've got something really complex, kind of like this, uh, kind of like this bare tank assembly on the right-hand side, you could create something like that. You also are probably going to have drawings that go with it. So that's something that DriveWorks Solo is going to do really well, whether that's creating one simple drawing or if it's gonna be creating 10 drawings. DriveWorks Solo gives you a lot of flexibility for what kinds of drawings you want, rescaling your views, making sure that everything fits the right way. It also creates some simple documents. So if you wanted something kind of like this, uh, for a simple quote, simple bill of material, you can create documents like that. It fills in the information for you, and then you get to spit those out at the end. Interacting with it is done using forms. So here are three different examples of different forms. Basically, this is where our users plug in their information. So they're going to say things like, what is our quote? What company are we with? What kinds of heights do we want and widths and depths? That's all information that then we take and we store it as data inside of DriveWorks so that we can then work with it. We can use those inputs to drive our models. So how do we drive our models, specifically our SOLIDWORKS models? Well, we start off by telling drivers that we want to control something and we do that with what's called capturing. Capturing just tells drivers this model this feature, this dimension, is going to change in some way, shape, or form. Now, I say that we only do that if it's going to change, though. The reason for that is, let's say that we've got a hex bolt, and that hex bolt exists 100% of the time. It's never going to go away. It always has to be there. Well, in that case, we're not going to tell drivers anything about it. If drivers doesn't know that it exists, then it's not going to go and delete it. It's not going to go and change it. We just let SOLIDWORKS manage that. We don't have to manage it inside of drivers. So we only say what will change. So what can change? Well, parts, assemblies, and drawings are all three things that you're going to see quite a bit. Now, inside of those things, like I said, or like I mentioned, we might capture things like our dimensions. So we might say that the height of something changes based off of the user input. Our number, our patterns might change, things like the, uh, the pattern separation as well as the number of instances in our patterns. Our features could change. We might get rid of a hole. We might suppress it. Uh, we might get rid of parts. So features and parts go together. Let's say we have windows. Well, windows are going to be individual parts inside of assemblies. Maybe we get rid of those, and then we get rid of the cut feature. And we can control things like our notes. So maybe our customers put in comments inside of the form for what they expect on the drawing, 
maybe we put those comments in a note and then that note gets pushed directly into our drawings, which when they're done, go straight to our production. And again, it's more than just solder files. This can be pushed into XML based documents. You don't have to create documents if you don't want to, but if you want to create a quote, bill of material, a cover letter, you can do that using driver solo. So how we control this stuff after we've told drivers, this is what I want to control. How do we do it? That's done with rules. Rules are very simply any logic that you use to define your model. If you can describe to me in words, this is why we do something, then we can then put that into drive words. So this might be math. So for example, the height of something might be whatever the user says, minus 50, minus 50 of whatever unit of measurement you're using. The reason for that might be that's our buffer height, or that is actually the height of this component, but then we put something else on top of it. That's just simple math. You might have an if this, then that situation. Well, that's just an if then statement, very similar to like Microsoft itself. Same with strings. We might be concatenating information because we can use Drive Solo to name our models for us, as well as put together folder paths. So we can use strings. We can also use table lookups, look up information, get a list of information out of a table, which we'll be doing here in a bit. Essentially, if you can do it in Microsoft Excel, very likely you're going to be able to do the same kind of thing inside of Drive Solo. The logic is very similar. So if you're familiar with Excel based logic, then you're going to have a great time inside of Drive Solo. And we write these rules for everything. So for dimensions, for file paths, for the names of our files, for the configurations that we're going to be accessing, all of that information is driven by rules. Some of it might be very simple, take the user input and that is the answer. Some of it might be complex. We might have things like, what is the quantity? We're going to round down the width minus 18 divided by 50, and then we'll add one to it. Well, that takes a little bit of logic, it takes a little bit of, okay, what are we really saying here? But that is our, our pattern quantity. So that's something that we're going to control in that way. Okay. I understand what rules are. I understand that we're capturing stuff. Where do I do all of that? Well, we make our changes inside of what I'm going to call the driver solo administration tool. Now the administration tool technically is a, a driver's professional thing. So we could call it the project designer if we want to be fancy, but the admin tool is just easier to remember for me. This is where all of our changes happen though. This is where we're going to update things. If you look on the right hand side, it's where we'll update the forms, which is the user interface as well as the navigation. You know, I start on page one, then I go to page two, then page four, and then page three. Maybe I should renumber my pages, but that's kind of how my form navigation works. It takes me from one step to another. It guides our users through their process. We can also update the logic and the base information and the models that we're going to be driving. So we do that through our variables. Variables are really just going to be used if we've got information that we want to reuse, calculations that are going to be used multiple times, put it in a variable, it's nice and easy to access. Tables are going to store tabular information in this case. Now they're not smart like at cell tables, but this is able to say, like, take a long list of information, like all of the colors of the rainbow and their RGB values. You can do that. You can put that directly into a table and look those bits of information up. It's also where our, our outputs are going to be managed. So we can put things like those document outputs that I've mentioned a couple of times with the bill of material cover letter and uh, quote. It's also where we're going to put our model rules. So what happens to our models if a user picks this? Well, we define that in our model rules. Where are these models being saved? That's also done in the model rules. As we make our changes, we need to test them. Specifically, we need to start off by testing our forms. So making sure that our user interface makes sure that it flows, making sure that as a user, it's intuitive what I'm trying to do. So going through and putting in test values, that's going to be step one. Also using our models. So as we go through, I want to draw your attention up here to this little blue cube. As we're going through inside of DriveWorks, we can actually test this. We can say, okay, run a preview of these models. Show me what this is going to look like in a real life production environment. Like if a user ordered exactly this right now, what would we be getting? Great way to debug, great way to just test out. Or if you're just going to validate something and say, I expect this is going to work, but I don't want to put this in production until I'm positive. Using that test, you can run multiple tests at a time. Just say, okay, we're going to test it at the max length. Okay, we're going to take 20 off of that length and test it again. Definitely utilize that test function because that's going to make sure that when you're done, you have a robust project. So let's take off the mask. Let's jump into driver solo. In SolidWorks, I'm going to show you how to make some changes. We're going to update our user interface, add a table, add some information and then read that information into our models. So here we are. 
Now, this is just a cupboard assembly. Uh, there's nothing too fancy about it. If we go ahead and just hide a couple things, you can see there's it's not a whole lot in here. It's fairly straightforward, something that you might put in your living room. But these are models that we're going to control. A customer might ask for different materials, might ask for different sizes. You can imagine all of that being true. So where do we start? Well, we start off by capturing our models. And that's what's been done here. So we told drivers to control this cupboard assembly. And then every checkbox here indicates another model in this feature tree over on the left. You'll notice it kind of mirrors that feature tree. That indicates this is something I need to control. This is something that will change based off of user inputs. Now, if I go through here, every checkbox is checked. So like I said, if something is never going to change, then we don't need to check it. So everything in this model will change in some way, shape, or form. You could imagine, though, this dowel, well, this is probably just a standard size. So maybe there's a chance that we would get rid of it in a certain situation. That's why we've captured it. But this variable could always exist. So if that always exists and it never really changes based off of these or inputs, well, then we probably don't need to check that box. We could uncheck it. As we go through and capture our parts, we need to then tell it internally to the parts what we need to change. Now, this might not be anything. The rules that we write for parts might just be delete this part if this happens. Made sense. You don't really have to write any dimensions for that. But for the dimensions and features, what kinds of things could we change? Now, I do want to highlight something about this. We're looking at the top level assembly. So all of these dimensions that you see are top level dimensions. They are dimensions that exist in this assembly right here. However, if I'm looking for what is the size of this cupboard top, that is not going to be here. Simple answer as to why. Well, that's a part level dimension. So if I actually go into the cupboard top, then I'm going to see the width, the depth, the size of this. That's all going to be controlled at the part level. So when you're capturing your dimensions, when you're capturing your features, it's important to ask, where is this controlled? Is it part level, assembly level, or is it even drawing level? Those are all different things that can exist here. What I'm going to do now is jump into the project designer or the drive it solo administration tool, as I've referred to it. And this is the first page of our user interface. Actually, this is the second page of our user interface. The first page is this details section. Now, first page, second page, that's all controlled right here in the form navigation. So we start off on details, then we go to design, then appearance, price, file naming, demo features, and then we're finally done with it. I can go through here and say, okay, uh, just find me the details form. Double click, and now we're, back, we're right back here. Up here at the very top, we have a list of all of the different features that we can put into our form. So things like labels, things like hyperlinks, if we want them to be able to go to our website directly from the form, that can exist here. A combo box, a drop-down list, we're gonna be using that here in a second. All that stuff's here. As we fill this out, it's pretty important that we actually go through here and we test this, we validate it. We make sure that as user, we can type in the information that we expect. To do that, I click on test up here. Now, what's really cool about test mode, that's what this is called. When I go into test mode, this becomes my default values. So then as I go through and as I look at my models, as I look at the resulting model rules, I can actually have information pre-populated. Now, it might make sense to clear this out when it goes into full production, but for debugging, this is a fantastic way of doing it. So what's the address? Ah, let's go to Disney. One, two, three, Mickey Mouse way. And we're gonna put Nick as my salesperson here. Notice we can also pick our currency, US dollar, pound sterling, and euro. Now this is handy, but what if I can only sell to certain countries? What if I've got questions about, you know, where are these people located? In that case, it might make sense to add in a, a combo bots. Nick works in marketing and it, it's, it's important in marketing that you know, where are my users? So let's find out if these guys are in the United States, if these guys are maybe in Great Britain or Austria or something like that. So how do we do that? Well, we need to add a box here. We need to add a, a list of choices. So what would we go with? Well, we don't want to go with a label because a label is just text. That's all it is. It's not really customizable. You can imagine we might go with a list box. Now, a list box is really just going to be a long list of items that we click through and then it's there. We kind of have limited real estate here and I'd like it to be a drop down. So I'm going to go with the combo box. I'm going to call it country. Every form control inside of drivers has its own unique name. So if you want to use country, then you can only use country once and now you have to name it something different. Now we just drag and drop, put it wherever it needs to go. 
nice and easy. And we can see that the width here isn't quite the same. So if we compare these, we can see one's 95 over here on the bottom right. And we can see that this one right here is 100. So let's make this 95 just to be symmetric. Just make sure it lines up with everything else. Nice and easy. Okay, but it doesn't look like there's anything in here. So how do we add that? Well, again, on the right-hand side, this is where we're going to control things like the behavior, the size of it, even what it looks like. We can change the fonts if we want to. Right here in the items section, we can start populating it with different pieces of information. So if I click on the three dots, that opens up the DriveWorks rule builder. In here, I can start typing a pipe delimited list of information that I might want. So I can just type USA, pipe bar for my second list, my second item list. And I could say these three. That's fine. That works. But what if I want this to be you know, somewhat dynamic? What if I want to read this out of a longer list? What if I had 50 things to type in here? Yeah, I don't want to type 50 things. You don't want to type 50 things. Nobody does. So let's make this more dynamic. Let's actually use this to just pull information out of a table. That way, if I add more rows, it just automatically populates. So how do we do that? Well, over on the left-hand side, we can see where we control our data. We control our rules. So you can see information about variables. You can see information about tables. If you want more information and you're inside a driver solo, the online help file is an excellent way to just look up things. There are a lot of examples. There are a lot of just bits of information in there that can kind of guide you down your path to your rules. We're going to go to our tables. Now, these tables contain all of the information that we're using for lists. So we can see there's one for currency. And on currency, it has US dollar, pound sterling, and euro, and has their symbol and even their exchange rate. So that's helpful. But there's nothing here about country. Now, I could add a column for country, but I, eh, I think I want this to be a separate list. So what I'll do is at the top, I'll click Add. It's called a simple table. So it's just tabular data. Again, there's no intelligence to these tables. It's just basically a, a table of information you can look up that information in. We'll call this country. So I can manually type in this whole list if I want to. But again, if I've got 50 things, I don't want to manually type 50. So what I'm actually going to do is go to this list I have in Microsoft Excel. See, I've got 10 countries here. I've already sorted them alphabetically because I can do that in Excel. I'm going to copy this information. I'm going to go back to drive it solo. And I'm going to paste it. I'm going to paste it in cell A2. And the reason for that is cell A1 is the header. And I'll explain why that's important here in a moment. But now I have 10 different things. So I mentioned the colors. That's a really common example that I'll use in demonstrations. I have RGB 255, 255, 255. Well, that can start at zero for all three of those. So I have over 750 different options there. So I don't really want to have to type all of those in. So it's really nice to just be able to say, okay, copy paste. And I'll click okay. And now it's saved. So now I see I have another table. Let's now link this back to my form controls. So we have this drop down. It still doesn't have anything in it. It's not automatically linked to it. So how do we want to do that? We'll go into our form. And now we can go into our functions list and we can actually list everything in that column. Now I'm going to click on this list and be warned, it is a long list. But that's because there are a lot of different things that you can do. So like I said, if you can do it in Microsoft Excel, that function is likely in here somewhere. So you can say, is it an even number? Is this an integer? What we're looking for is the list all function. Now we can do even further than that. We can say list all conditional. So if I were to put that, uh, the currency in that same table, I could say list all if it has US dollar as the, as the option, which would only give us the United States. But I'm just going to do list all. Just show me everything in that list. So by double clicking it, it actually gives us a little helper down here. So what table am I looking in first? Well, we created a table. We called it country. So it's right here. Now that column name. And now this is why those headers are so important, because if I didn't put a header on it, the column would actually say Austria, because Austria is the first thing in cell A1. So it's important that we have those columns there. We click on Finish. And now it's pulling this information. We can see down here, what are the options? So the result is Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Ireland, Italy, long list of options. If I go in and I change that list, well, this is dynamically pulling from that table so that anytime I update that table, I don't have to worry about updating this list. It's going to update automatically for us. So it's listing everything. 
from the country table and everything in column one. So we click OK. Now we can hit test and go through and say, OK, which country are we in? Ireland, United States, which I am. So we'll go with that. OK, that's pretty easy. That makes a lot of sense. Let's implement this stuff, though. So I'm actually going to switch off of this. And we're going to go to the design options. Here we have our design constraints. How large can we make our assemblies? Well, we can see here that our maximum value for the height is 1500. You can see our minimum is 400. But let's say that I just got a call from my supplier and they said, hey, we actually now have pieces that are 2000 and these are millimeters. So we've got a two meter long sheet if you want to start selling that. Perfect. I want to. So what do I have to do? Well, I can see that I've got a maximum value here, so I need to update that. So the maximum first is controlled here. So we can see minimums and maximum values. These are numeric text boxes where we can set upper and lower limits. All I have to do is say a maximum value is now 2,000. Perfect. That's done. That's all I had to do. But this text, this is just a label, so we probably want this to be a little bit more robust. Make sure it's accurate, more importantly. So we'll make that say 2,000. Easy. Now again, if I want to test, 1,500 is my max. So down here, if I actually try to type in 1,700, it's going to automatically correct me down to 1,500. It's never going to let me exceed it. Up here, though, we've set a new maximum value, so now we're OK. Great. I'm happy about that. Let's make sure that the model rules are going to be OK as well. So we go down to our model rules. And we can search for all of our rules that are called height. And I'm just going to check a couple of them. So we've got the back. And we've got the left side. So the left side is just that left board. We've got the right side as well. And we also have the back of it. So how are these going to be impacted? Well, we can see there's the height rule. And there's the height rule. You can see that they're a little bit different. So the back, we can tell that because the component, which is covered back, is the full height minus 50. So that's just our buffer height. Maybe it's 50 millimeters off the ground. So really the height of this board is take the user input minus that height off the ground. And, and that's actually the height of the piece. Makes sense. So then we can see it's pulling 1700 directly from the height input. If I go down here, I can find that height input. There it is. Height 1700. Down here, I see the same thing. Take away 50. So just simple math. There we go. Compare that to the height here. Well, I'm not seeing any errors because this, these are pretty simplistic rules. So we say 1700, that's exactly what the height return is. So I'm happy with that as well. I don't have any reason to believe that this is going to break. You could imagine though, these values and these rules can get fairly complex. So for example, the top shelf from the top. So what is that distance? What is that separation uh, between the very top of the assembly and the top of that top shelf. We're going to take some variables there. So what is our shelf quantity? So in that case, we're probably going to be taking whatever our user says. If they say three shelves, well, the bottom shelf is already in place. So the actual patterned quantity is just going to be two additional. So that's why it's going to be two. We're going to say that round that height down, take away 36, take away 50, divide it by three, and take away any decimals. We don't want any decimals. So that's all that's happening here. Now, if we saw any errors, we would see a pound signed error or a pound sign name or, or some kind of issue. We would see that down here in our helper. But the helper says this is a clean rule. The green background tells us that things are clean as well. So we're not too worried about this. This is just some math. It's just some logic with an if statement. Made sense. So we can hit cancel. And we're OK with that. Let's test these changes. That's the last part of this is making sure that these changes are going to be valid. Now, all we've done is change the user interface, but I could have changed how my height is controlled. I could have said it's actually height plus 50 if I wanted to. All of that can be checked in here, and we can go ahead and see it. So in Drive It Solo, it, it seems a little scary, but if you want to test your changes, you have to close this project designer. Now the Save button is active, so we'll activate that. And to actually go through and test, we hit this little Run button, this little gear with a play. Now this is our form. Now I can go through here and update everything, but because these are my default values, I didn't have to manually type any of this stuff in. 
So we can go through here again, check all this, Great Britain. Now I have to manually change this. So you can see a situation where if I choose Great Britain, then choose pound sterling. If I choose US dollar, then United States. I could set something like that up if I want to. I can force it to default to those values. We'll click next. And then what kind of height do I want? Well, again, now I can actually go up to be like 1832. And I can say that this minimum value is, I don't know, 786. And we'll put this one at 555. When you're testing it, just test some values that you go, well, this could be something that a customer could order, making sure that we're not going to have anything unforeseen. And to make sure that everything shows it properly, we click on the blue cube. Driver then actually goes through. It's going to open up the top level model, push through any changes. So it's going to replace the doors with glass doors. It's going to change the height, width, and depth. It's going to update any patterns. So again, depending on how large this is, we might have more or fewer shelves. And finally, Travis will close down all of the different changes and just open up our top level assembly for us. Sometimes it takes a second. You can see every dimension that's being updated rebuilds the final geometry. And now we have a shelving unit. Now we can spin this around and this is a real life solids model. So if we do encounter issues, maybe a mate breaks for some reason. Well, we can go through here and diagnose why did that mate break? Oh, because it was mated to this part that we said to delete. So maybe we change how we do that. Uh, in this case, everything worked pretty well, but I'm looking at the height, we're almost two meters high. So this is six, almost six feet. And uh, I'm not six feet tall. And these handles are all the way up at the top. So maybe I would want to say, if this gets above a certain height, move these down to the middle. Maybe that makes sense. And that could be my next change, where then I start testing it. And I make sure that the height of those doorknobs actually works for how tall I am as a human and instead of having to reach over my head to open it up, I can just open it up at, at chest level or something that's much easier to do. But that's all it takes to make a change inside a driver. It's just understand where you're looking, making sure that, you know, if you need to make a user interface change, making sure that you're thinking about where is this information going to live? If it's a list, is that list going to ever change in the future? If no, you could hard code that list in, but putting it in a variable, putting it inside of a table can always make it easier to make changes later. So that is removing the mask of driver's soul. It's not, it's not a scary tool if you want to make changes to it. If you're familiar with its cell, it's going to be a nice springboard directly into how do I start working inside of driver's, making sure that yours, the user interface is intuitive, making sure that my rules are propagating properly. If I've got errors, I'm going to use the little helper. I'm going to understand, oh, so I tried to use the height control, but actually I meant to use the width control. So these, these numbers aren't quite lining up. Just understanding that and reviewing step-by-step what have I changed and where does that affect my models? So what we've gone, gone through today is first we introduced driver solo. What is it? It's a design automation tool that works for your solids models, your solids drawings, as well as some simple XML documents. How do we control our solids models? Well, we do that by capturing them. So we tell drivers, this is what I want to control. And we only do that for things that are going to change. Now that might be dimensions, might be features. It might even be parts, might be notes inside of a drawing all things that I can capture and control and write values to with driver solo. How do we write that information to driver solo? We'll do that with rules. Rules are just any piece of information, any piece of logic that you use to explain how your models go together. So then making your changes, it's important that you test this. So test your forms, test your models and actually run through and run through with that little blue, blue cube and create some models, make sure that everything goes together as you would expect. And then finally, we removed the mask and when we made, we made some changes. We took a table, we copied some information out of its cell, put that into a driver simple table. Then we listed that information into a form control. And finally, we went through and we updated what could we do with the height, make it a little bit larger if we want to, ran some tests on it, made sure that it gave us the dimensions we would expect. If it hadn't, we could have made some changes, but it all seemed to work perfectly well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all for attending the webinar today. I hope you guys got something out of it. 